Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over the MMA card for uh, Saturday, August 13th. And it's a really, really good card uh, from a DFS perspective, uh, in the sense that you can play a lot of different fighters. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through kind of fight by fight to show you all the different options. And then after I've done that, we're going to relook at it from a construction perspective. Because this is a card that's very different from the last, I mean, three or four least cards uh, on the uh, on the board. Um, in the past month or so, we've had situations where we've had incredible favorites and underdogs, which really were kind of tough to play. Um, so people got forced into certain constructions, and it just it was just really really awkward. Uh, in this particular card. It's kind of the opposite. Um, you can make a case for a lot of different situations. And um, as a result, you'll find you'll find the ability to get unique with different types of constructions. Uh, and, and I'll get to that. I promise you I'll get to that. There's also some very sneaky line value in the, on this card. Um, there's some very obvious line value but there's also some very sneaky line value, which, which I will get to. So I want to go through, well, should I go through the, the, the obvious line value first? Um, sure. So let, let, let's start just for the hell of it with the, um, with the Onama land we are fight, because this is the one which stands out as the overwhelming uh, value proposition. Uh, and I'll go over why. So you'll see Onama is a three to one favorite plus so maybe like three three point five to one depending on where you look in addition to that you have an inside the distance prop which is really strong fight doesn't go to decision minus 225 in total but more to the point you have onamu who's basically minus 120 to finish inside the distance which is very very strong um now you have a couple of other fights which are just like that such as uh, bruno silva versus uh mirshar you have Bruno Silva, likewise, about a three to one favorite, um, not as big of a favorite um, as uh, Onama, but pretty big favorite. And the inside the distance prop is um, it's a little bit better for Silva, but not much. You know, minus 165 uh, for him to finish inside the distance. But Onama is just as just about as good and a little bit better win odds. And then you compare that as well to. Um, there's a couple like that. You have Benitez, who is also a minus 350 favorite, right? So we're comparing all these to Onama, who's a minus three, you know, 350 favorite as well. So on to uh, Benitez, also a 350 favorite, strong inside the distance prop. Uh, you have, uh, once again, Benitez winning by TKO minus 140, a little bit better than Onama, but not that much better. Um, so you have that, and then also you have Quinlan over Wit, and Quinlan's about again about a three to one favorite, maybe a little less, but um, and he has a strong inside the distance prop as well. Um, Quinlan winning by TKO is about a pick 'em. He has a little submission uh, prop as well. Overall, Quinlan inside the distance about one minus one twenty, about the same as Onama. Okay, so you have four or so fighters all that have that same kind of profile. We'll we'll get to what's her name, uh, uh, Godinez in a minute, but all all of those have the same kind of profile. About a three to one favorite, and about a pick them to go inside the distance, uh, maybe a little bit better. But the difference here in price is striking. You know, all these other fighters that I brought up. You have Benitez 9,300, Godinez 9,200, Quinlan 9,100, Silva 9,000. And you go all the way down to Onama at 8,600. You're saving a full 400 to 700 going down to Onama. So that is extreme relative value um, for Onama. So, I mean, right off the bat, like if you were going to play cash games, this would be where I would start. Um, because there's just, you just can't, you can't dispute that, you know, it's, it's just a clear misprice. This is the same actually as last week 
where we had the same fight schedule, right? Wit, Wit and Quinlan were supposed to fight, but last week they had the same fight as um, 8,700, 7,500, 8,700, 7,700, whatever that was, um, where Quinlan should have been about 9,100. They, they moved him to 9,100 for this week, but last week he was sitting there at extremely strong line value. And as a result, he was going to be the most popular popular fighter, I guess. Um, but now the the fighter who holds that you know holds that mark is 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 Onama. Onama is, in my opinion, clearly going to be the best play, right? I think that he's also going to be the highest owned. I mean, people are not stupid, but we do have to start with that as a point of reference. You know, this is an extremely extremely strong play. Um, what I like to do is go through these fights. And, and just show you what you can do with some of these. I want to avoid for now the, the, the close ones, like the mid-rangers. And I'll show you why in a minute. We'll get back to Zalal Blackshear. Quinlan Witt, okay? We, we broke this down last week. But once again, Quinlan has, again, as I mentioned before, very strong win odds, very strong inside the distance prop. Um. Wit is known to have a, a very weak chin, which is what, you know, is what contributes to the strong inside distance prop for Quinlan. So he's a really, really strong play. On the other hand, Wit has an extreme win condition um, going in his favor. In other words, Wit's plan is going to be to get takedowns, okay? If, in fact, he wins, if you follow this, it's going to be because he got takedowns, which means is that he's going to score very well in his wins. Okay. And how often is that going to happen? I don't know. About, about 33% of the time, right? Cause it's two to one underdog. So he had 7,100. It's a very, very strong uh, underdog play as far as UFC DFS goes. Okay. Because once again, if he wins, he's going to score well, you know, and that's what you have to look at with some of these fighters is Okay, what's their inside the distance prop? All right, if that's that's great, if that's good, then great. But if not, how will he score or she score in a decision? And Wit is a perfect, perfect example of someone that if they do in fact win, you're going to want him. You know, there's almost no variation where he wins and does not make the optimal lineup. Right, so um, it's a very very strong underdog play. So let's let's move on. Um, Osborne against Nam. Osborne is likewise a three to one favorite, just like these other guys. He doesn't quite have the same inside the distance prop as these others. Like here you have fight doesn't go to decision as minus 165. And you have Osborne winning inside the distance as a plus 120. It's a little bit weaker than the others. Not that much weaker. And he's 8,800. So relative to these 9Ks, I think he's actually pretty fairly priced, you know, he's not, ex you know, he's not obviously as good of a play as Onama, but he, I think he's fairly priced relative to these guys. So you could certainly play him. Nam is getting a lot of not publicity, but a lot of talk about his, his win condition that he's not going to be able to win a decision because he just doesn't throw enough volume and his one path to victory is in KO. Um, as a matter of fact, if you look at it, you have Nam winning inside the distance plus 425, which at first glance doesn't seem that great, but that means 20% of the time he's going to get a KO. So 20% of the time, he's probably going to be in the optimal, right? Because if he is what, 7K? Um, let's look. Nam is seven, seven, well, 7,400. It's very likely to say at least that he's in the optimal th that 20% of the time. Now, is that as good of a play as Wit? No, because Wit, you know, Wit is simply his, 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 whatchamacallit, his money line is just better. You know what I mean? And I think that in Wit's wins, he doesn't score any worse than Nam in his wins, except, you know, Nam does have that first round knockout upside. In other words, so if, 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 if Nam knocks Osborne out in the first round, that, 110, 120, that, that's probably going to eclipse what Wit can get in a win. You know, Wit's probably going to get like maybe 90 or 95 in a win because even if he gets his takedowns, he's not the type to get like multiple takedowns and a lot of 
a lot of ground and pound and stuff like that. He's more of a wrestler that's going to just wrestle the guy down and control him, which is not really that 120, 130 upside, more of like a 90 upside. So um, I think Nam probably a slightly better upside in his wins than Wit, although um, in a decision, right, he, his, he's not exactly going to do so well. Um, so I think that Nam and Wit are pretty similar as far as underdogs go. Nam is a little bit more expensive, so he's 7,400. So who do I think is better between Wit and Nam? I don't know, but I think they're both very playable. And Osborne, I think, is very, very fair. I don't think he's like the top play on the slate, but I think that he's certainly reasonable. I think that his lack of a, as of a strong, as strong of an inside the distance prop as some of those 9,300s I described earlier makes him not quite as good, but, you know, you get a price break on you know, he's going to be only 80, he's only 8,700 compared to the 87 or 800, uh, 8,800 compared to the 92, 9,300 of the other guys. So I think that's very reasonable. Um, okay. So moving up uh, the card here, Benitez Altaveras, right? So you have Benitez, who we described earlier. He is a minus 350, minus 390. He's, I think, the biggest favorite on the card, at least very close to Onama. Actually, he's a little bit better than Onama. And his, what is he? To go inside the distance, he is you know, minus 188. So he does have the strongest inside the distance prop as well. And as a result, that's why he is the highest price. I mean, he is 9,300 for a reason. And the thing is, is that on the other side of this, you have Antiveros, who I think his entire path to victory is an early is an early KO, you know. Like you look at his inside the distance prop here. Antiveros inside the distance is like plus. You only get three fifty. When you think about this, he's. I mean, he's almost a two eighty underdog in the first place. So I mean, you think about this. I mean, he doesn't really win too often, but plus three fifty. That's more than eighty. That's more than twenty percent of the time he's going to get a KO. You know, I mean, you think about it, he's got a better chance or as good of a chance, I guess, of a knockout as Nam does, if that makes any sense. Let's take a look at that one more time. Like Nam, Tyson Nam by inside the distance is plus 425, right? Nam wins the plus 425. Where Antiveros inside the distance what did I say? Is plus 350 or up to 450. So it's close. So Antiveros is actually actually probably a better underdog than than neither of these guys, right? Either Nam or Wit. Um, and it's kind of sick when you think about it, because he is a big underdog, but so much of his of his equity is in his KO upside that. You don't ever have to worry about him winning and not being optimal. So uh, I, I think that he's very live as well. You know, I, let's look at um, Godinez Hill. This is a different type of favorite. So Godinez is a minus 350, minus 370, very, very strong favorite. And her, her inside the distance prop is not that great. Uh, I think it's what's her inside the distance plus 350, which is obviously not good, but she has incredible upside for, with her takedowns, you know? So I mean, she, she, she's going to go relentlessly for those takedowns. And, and the thing about Angela Hill is, is that Angela Hill is, is, is the perfect opponent for Godinez to rack up fantasy points because she has just enough takedown defense that if she does get taken down, she'll probably find her way to get up, which means there's another opportunity to take her down again. Um, so this is a this is a tough fade if you want to know the truth. I mean, I thought about this, and you know, Angela Hill does have some does have some you know, some volume. She has some some you know she has some tricks. She's been around the block, and Gadini has, has certainly you know not fought the greatest in competition. Uh, the one time she fought someone who could have a good takedown defense in um, Carolina, she lost. So you can make a case for, you know, why you'd want to fade her. But 
boy, oh boy. I mean, that, 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 that takedown upside is just something you can't mess with. So she is a very, very strong favorite as well. On the other hand, Hill is not exactly a, the same type of underdog as the ones we talked about. Angela Hill's upside is really does not really exist here. I mean, if she wins, it's going to be because she was able to tough, tough, you know, stuff the takedowns, keep this at range, and win a very conservative, you know, uh, volume based decision. Okay, um, she's not knocking Lupita Di Godinez out. I don't think. And I just don't think she's going to score well or well enough, even in a law, even to win. Um, now she is very cheap. She's, I think she's under 7k um, or right at 7k. So you don't need that much, but boy, that's, that's a lot to ask. Um, so I don't think that Angela Hill carries that same degree of upside as these other underdogs that I would take shots at. Um, Boudet against Brzezeski, very, very low-level heavyweight fight. Um, but another one who's like kind of a three-to-one favorite. The fight doesn't go to decision. It's okay. You know, minus 200 in total. And then you get Boudet inside the, dis the, the distance is you know, minus 110. I mean, it's fair. I mean, is this that much worse than some of these others? It's actually pretty interesting. Boudet inside the distance is minus 110. Well, let's compare that to some of these for a second. I mean, what it was, maybe we're, maybe we're on to something here because you look at Silva, we'll get back to him, but he was, uh, he's TK minus 150 or minus 165. That's, that's, that's a significant difference, I guess. Um, so yeah, I guess, like I said, I guess it's fair. The Boudet price, nothing great, nothing terrible. I haven't seen any, I haven't seen really the case made for Brzezeski, which to me is it's a little bit off putting, you know what I mean? Because, um, I, why is it only minus 280, not minus 800 if no one has picked Brzezeski? I just think that, um, boy, are we supposed to take Brzezeski and just blindly go for this? Brzezeski's going to be, I will have to say this that Brzezki is going to be very, very low owned, right? I mean, I've been through all the content this week. Well, not all of it, but most of it. And this is the one guy who I don't think I've heard recommended by a single person, whether a betting bet or a DFS bet. So that said, this is heavyweight. And with that said, it's not as this he's only, he's a plus 800. He's only plus 240. I mean, he's going to win just as often but pretty close as Tyson Nam, just as often as as Jason Witt, you know, just as often as some of these other underdogs that people are take shots at, like Nate, Nate Landwehr or whatever. And just because no one is really knows who he is and hasn't really made the case for him in on in the content, are people gonna play him? And maybe this is maybe this is the real this maybe this is the dude that wins the full hundred and fifty thousand. You know, he's gotta be under 10% owned. Right, you would think, who's going to play this dude? I haven't heard anybody recommend him, so maybe this is the idea. Um, okay, um, we're going to get back to Lipsky Kachuera, but I, I guess we can talk about it now. This was the other fight that was canceled last week, and I'm I'm just not doing it with with Lip, with Lipsky. It's really weird, you know. She was minus one seventy going into last week, and <laughs> She missed weight, and it turns out she probably had COVID and got didn't get medically cleared. I mean, and now she's up to minus two hundred. I I don't I don't get any of it. So um, I don't I don't really quite understand what's going on with this fight. Um, I've heard people latch on to Cachoeira as an underdog. We'll, we'll talk we'll talk about all that when it comes to construction. We're gonna get to that in a minute. Um. All right, so Calvillo Nunez, this is sneaky, okay? This fight was a fight that was scheduled for a couple of months ago, maybe, and it was supposed to be a huge fade. No one was going to play anybody from this fight. Either both fighters are going to be 10% owned, and the fight got dropped off. Uh, I forget who, who dropped out, whatever it was, but now they're throwing this back out here again, and it's getting ignored, I think. 
And there's sneaky little line value here, you know? You look at Calvillo, and Calvillo is anywhere between minus 175 and a minus 205. So she's pushing this Lipsky type price, you know? She's pushing maybe not quite these top favorites, but she's her win odds suggest more of a 8,600, 7,800 situation. But from a pricing perspective, you can get her for only 8,300. So there's a little bit of sneaky line value in Cavillo, which I don't think people are talking about. And the other thing is there's also sneaky wrestling upside in Cavillo. Um, Cavillo's win condition is pretty pretty tied to her ability to wrestle here and wrestle effectively and at only 8300 and she's a minus 160 favorite or excuse me almost a minus 200 favorite i think this could this could fly under the radar so i i really like the cavillo play here in dfs and we're going to get to construction in a minute and and well you i think you'll end up playing even more but we'll, we'll get there so silva mirchart um I already went over the inside distance prop for, for Silva. It's extremely strong. I mean, it's minus 165 for him to win by TKO and he's minus 300 favorite and he's 9,200 and is he 9,200 exactly? Um, yeah. Um, you know, 9K actually makes sense. Totally reasonable. But yeah, Gerald Mearshart, who is, you know, he's a finisher, man. Um, if he wins this fight, I mean, he's going to be in the optimal. I mean, that's just that's just the bottom line here. So at minus two at plus two forty, I mean, let's look at Mirshar wins by submission. I mean, only plus five hundred. You know, about twenty percent of the time he gets it done. It's just as good as these other underdogs we talked about, like Hill and uh, and Nam and Alti Veros. I mean, I I think Mirshar is very very live. And I just want to just refer to this one, this one fight, a few a few fights back from your chart, which which really rings true for me, and that was find this your chart. Three fights ago, he was against Muradov, and he was a huge underdog. Okay, um, and he was sixty nine hundred on the board, and what they were saying was that he was obviously going to get outstruck by Muradov, but he might be able to get a sub if, you know, uh, later on in the fight. I have to say that right off the bat in the first round, you knew Mirashart was winning. Uh, this is my opinion. Like, if you watch that fight and you and you watch the fight expecting Muradov to get blast, uh, to, to blast him from the feet, you'd be very surprised. I mean, Mirashart actually was better on the feet than Muradov in that first round. I mean, he was actually getting to him and it made his life really easy in the second round when he was able to get the multiple takedowns and sub. So this guy's, this guy's got tricks. You know, he, he beat Stolzfitz, he subbed him and Stolzfitz came back to win. Um, he lost to Jotko, whatever. Um, so I think he's very live and, 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 and it's a very reasonable underdog. So again, here's another fight where, it's really easy to play like these underdogs and they, they all make a lot of sense. And then you have <laughs> Murzov versus Devin Clark. So this is another one, which is just a, I mean, Devin Clark might end up being who knows, but, but, but he is just a very, very logical underdog to play in DFS. And he's, he's barely an underdog in the first place. He's 7,800 or whatever. And Mirzakhanov, Mur, he was getting waxed in his last fight by Inchukwi before he caught him with a flying knee. Um, and Devin Clark's tricky, man. He, he, he chain wrestles if, when, 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 it's, when it's available to him. He has pretty good submission, a pretty good submission game. He, he's also knocked some people out. I mean, this guy's good. And, you know, at 7,800, his win condition is extremely strong here. So it's as I think he's going to be one of the more popular underdogs, but who knows, right? So 
excuse me. So here's another underdog that I think is really, really live. Um, as far as Mirzakhanov, let's take a look at his inside the distance prop. Um, pretty good, actually. Plus 140 to win by TKO. That's not bad. He's plus 120 to win inside the distance. Is that any, is that much worse than some of these other we talked about? Well, I don't think so. So I think this fight could be kind of a sneaky key fight here. Um, and we'll get back to that in a minute. Uh, Lucindo, Yaraqui, uh, I I haven't been able to make heads or tails of this. There are two, two female fighters that nobody knows anything about. They're priced one of them at eight. It looks like they're priced fairly. You know, Yaraguay is minus 200 on the board. And she's 8,700 on DraftKings, and the other one is 7,300. Um, there's just no information. I presume this is efficient. I don't see a great inside the distance prop. I'll probably end up fading it. We'll get back to that. We'll, I promise you, we'll get to construction in a minute. Um, Onama Landwehr, I spoke about the Onama side. I mean, just extreme line value there. I don't know why I'd want to play land we're on the other side of it um you know i've heard a case made for him being able to win but i just can't i just can't do it with those with that type of line line problem you know um you have land who's a plus 260 and you're only getting 70 you have to still have to pay 7800 for him and i'm not doing that or whatever is that what he is 7800 um 7600 still I and mean, this is a it's a brutal line to have to fight into, so I'm not going to do that. And in the main event, you know, Cruz Vera, this is a, probably going to be a real boring fight. You know, yeah, you have Vera at, at minus 230. I I don't, I just don't think that he has, that he rates to score as many points as some of these others. You know, I think that Onama or, or what's his name? Silva. Um, Benitez, Quinlan. I mean, I think, think of, I think Vera on his best, not his best day, but I think that look, Dominic Cruz. He's 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 evasive. He's first of all, he's at home, right? That's another thing to to throw out there. You know, Cruz is from San Diego. You have who else? Uh, Angela Hill. She was she was coming out of San Diego. There's somebody else that's from the area, whatever. So, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that if if you, if you fight if you play against these guys from San Diego and the decision doesn't go your way, you're not really allowed to complain because you have been warned. Um, so, but Vera is probably a little bit better. But Vera is just kind of a, he's a slow starter. He just kind of likes to you know kick you and and do stuff that doesn't usually add up to a lot of fantasy points. You know, you might eventually clip Cruz and knock him out in the third or fourth round or something. But what, what's that going to get you? 85? I mean, I don't know. Uh, then you get Cruz at 7,600. I mean, he's not going to knock out Vera. I mean, what is he going to get really in a decision over five rounds? I mean, I guess it's possible that he can get 80 or 90 in a decision. But – this is not a main event that you really want to go out of your way to target, in my opinion, at least. Um, so for me, uh, where where I have been known to just lock in the main event for a lot of reasons, I, I might I might end up full fading this one. It's possible. There's just so much upside of these other fighters. I mean, think about think about the various upsides from Onama, um, Silva, Benitez. These are all. Quinlan, like all these guys can get first round KOs, like with no no problem. I mean, you imagine that. Imagine you have four guys with 120, and now you're sitting there with Vera that needs it. Yeah, who needs it? You know what I mean? Like it's uh it's tough. Now, again, it also, it's also tough to get all four of those guys in. We'll talk about that in a minute. But if if those guys don't win, like let's say that if Benitez doesn't get a first round KO, it's very possible he got first round KO. So then you get on Tavero's money in there. So it's it's I think the main event's a tough event, tough main event to play. Um, okay, so with all that said, I said that all for a reason. Number one, because all that is true about my analysis of these fights, but remember that everybody is thinking about it the same way. Okay. I think that everybody's going to identify 
these same types of underdogs, right? Like Clark, Witt, um, who else? Antiveros even, maybe Tyson Nam, um, Mearshart even. So I think what a lot of people are going to do is build lineups with those 9200s and use those underdogs to kind of make them all work, which to me means that those types of constructions are going to be the most popular. So in my world, I think that the mid-range is where you're going to want to play, okay? I think that the relative, the ownership of the mid-range fighters relative to what they would be kind of like in a vacuum is going to be extremely low because the way construction is going to work, people are going to be able to play these 9300s really easily or 9200s really easily because... You can make such an easy case for all these underdogs. So what, what I want to do then is go back to some of these mid-range plays and, and, and dive into them just a little bit. You got to have a little bit of vision. But the first thing I wanted to mention is that, is that remember that Mirza Khanoff, Devin Clark fight, I think is a really important fight to get in there. You know, and, and, and think about this. Like if Devin Clark is going to be an extremely popular underdog, which I think he is, I think you're going to get some real good leverage out of Mirza Khanov. Um, so I want you, you know, just think about that. Let's look at these other mid rangers because this is where I think you want to play, but they're it's just kind of tough to do. Um, we're going to get back to what might be the key fight in a minute, but let's go back to this Black Shear Zoal fight. Okay, these this they're the 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 pricing here is kind of what you want to see. Um, you have 8,200 AK. I'll tell you, I, I've, I've watched content. I've looked, I've even seen tape. And, and the fact of the matter is I have no idea which of these guys is going to win. Okay. What I do know is that both of them have kind of good grappling and, and sort of good wrestling. And these fights between good grapplers in my opinion, in my view, has gone one of two ways. Uh, number one is that they got they just cancel each other out. It turns into a striking affair, and it's a duh. And that seems like a cool thing to say and a cool thing to, to, to describe. But what I've also seen is that when you have two guys who rely on, on, on their wrestling and, and grappling, and one of them is just happens to be better than the other one, at it, it turns into a kind of an overwhelming fight pretty quickly. So I do feel as though this fight does have the possibility of one guy really just taking it to the other guy. And I don't know which one it's going to be. But the fact is, is that at 8,200 AK, I think this is going to be a range that is ignored. Well, not ignored, but it's just not going to be played because people don't need to. And if I think that if you play multiple lineups, if you get both sides of this fight, and you play it for, you know, that that variation where just one of them dominates the other one somehow, I think you're going to be ahead of the game. And then, then you go back to, to the lipsky Cachuera fight. Um, playing Cachuera is going to be rough, but the, the only thing that's really stopping me from doing it, I've seen just a lot of love for her. I just have this weird feeling she's going to be more popular than I think. So I want to take a look at that, but this is exactly the type of range I think that you want to take a shot at. Um, but I think that the real, the real key is going to be this Cavillo play. Okay. Cavillo has a good, great combination of line value and, and grappling upside. And it fits our mold. Of, of a mid-range type build. Um, and and I think I think it could be, I think it's 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 a really useful key. Uh, Mirror Shard Silver, we talked about. It. Yeah, sure, you can play both those. And then you get back to this Lucindo Jaraquai. Remember, I just mentioned, boy, there's no real tape on these guys. You really don't really know, whatever it is. And I'll say this: if I don't really know then probably a lot of people really don't know. 
And if I have no idea what to do with this fight, I'm sure everybody doesn't know what to do with this fight. Which means that you might have the opportunity to get a, whatchamacallit, a, um, a mid-range fighter like Jared White, 8,700, at relatively low ownership. And you might, you might, just might be able to get a sneaky Lucindo who, listen, from what I've heard, she likes to be aggressive and with her wrestling. And who knows? You know, maybe she's good. And if if she is at 7,500, listen, I, I know a lot of people are playing, playing, what's his name? Clark and, and Witt, you know, for their wrestling upset. But who's to say? Who's to say that Witt has a better chance of out wrestling Quinlan than um than than Lucindo has to get there against Jericho? You know, uh, nobody. So I think I think these mid range fights are kind of are kind of funky. You know what I mean? I I think that you probably do want to take a shot at those, which means though that you, l- listen if you play like a Mirza Mirza Kanoff, and then like a Jaraquai, and then like a um the the uh, Calvillo. I, I can't build the whole lineup for you, but but you see where I'm headed here. And you try to avoid that stars and scrubs build, I think you're gonna get somewhat unique. Um I will also say that from a projection perspective, you're probably not gonna have as strong of a median projection on your lineup, but but I think that I think you get such a break on the ownership in those combinations that it might be worth it. And and the other the other guys that again, as as I talk through this, that you don't want to sleep on are these 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 these, these filthy heavyweights you know, like Boudet and Brzezinski, especially the Brzezinski side. Like this, this is the type of play. This is the type of play that wins the million dollars, so to speak, that nobody is on. And it's not as if his odds are any worse than some of these other underdogs people are going to be playing. You know, people are going to play Nate Landwehr. They are. And he's a, and Nate Landwehr is a plus 240. And no one's going to play Brzezinski. And he's a plus 230. But the same type of, and Brzezinski's got heavyweight, you know, variants, you know. So, I think it's a really, really cool slate because definitely the best plays are the big favorites and the big underdogs. But if I can find that in two seconds, I think other people will too. And as a result, I think the mid-range might be where you want to get overweight. Uh, Hopefully, I did not confuse you too much with that, but that's what I'm doing. I'm going to be much, I'm going to make my builds probably by hand this week. Um, because I do think that if I just ran Sabres and ran Sims, that, that I would end up with a lot of stars and scrubs, as will everybody else. So I'm going to, I'm going to force in some of this other crap. I'm going to force in some of this Cavillo, force in some of this Budai Brzezinski, force in some of this, uh, um, more of this Morzakanov play. Maybe gets uh, be overweight on the Lucinda fight. That's that would be interesting, and certainly overweight on this Blackshear fight. Um, that's what I'm going to do, and uh, that will do it. Uh, good luck, everybody, this weekend. It's going to be hopefully we keep the uh, the card as big as it is, and I'll be interested to see what happens. Uh, good luck. <laughs>